The last lecture gave us a few reasons to be excited. For one thing, and I think most significantly from a theoretical point of view, it was a massive step towards being able to realize this ideal of optimal compression. Now we should understand that really optimal compression is sort of an unattainable ideal in general, but maybe there are cases where we can make certain assumptions that do allow us to approach or achieve it, or at least understand what the minimum size of a particular piece of data is, and so know how well our schemes are doing. And we did this uh, in the context of certain assumptions in the last lecture by defining a quantity called entropy, which is meant to represent the actual amount of information in a piece of data. We saw that computing the true entropy, which I decided eventually to denote by H infinity, was intractable. It was extremely difficult. And I also observed that even if we could compute it for some input sequence, this is not a very long sequence, it's got, what, 10 symbols, but we could have a thousand symbols or 10 symbols or a million symbols. Even if I were able to compute this quantity, having that number wouldn't tell me very much about how to perform good compression. Um, and moreover, even if it did, there's still the question of what overhead would I need to explain to some hypothetical decompressor what I'm doing. Now, we're still stuck on the topic of overhead. We're going to bring that back into our discussion later in this lecture, but certainly in the next one and the lectures after that. Um, so in the last lecture, we settled for this sort of watered down version of entropy, which I'm going to denote by H of S, the first order entropy of a particular sequence. And this only really applies, uh, those theoretical bounds we proved in the last lecture only really apply if our sequence um, can be interpreted as an independent set of observations um, of symbols from the same distribution. So I'm sampling some distribution and it's the same distribution for each symbol and every observation is independent. If that happens to hold for a particular sequence, then we actually are able to state a lower bound on the compression that we can obtain. And that would be this value here, where n is the length of the sequence and h of s is the first order entropy. So although we can still use techniques like determining the information content of a symbol or computing the first order entropy, even if our assumption that our sequence is a bunch of independent observations doesn't apply, this lower bound only applies if those assumptions hold. So we're allowed to use the techniques in the previous lecture even if our data is riddled with dependencies. But we can't be as confident that this lower bound is that relevant. A lot of the results that we stated last lecture that were dependent on first order entropy require that assumption to hold. So what I want to talk about today is, I guess, the practical matter of once I know, I guess, how much a symbol is worth, and recall that we define this measurement of the information content of a particular symbol, um, or the self-information of a symbol in the last lecture. Once I know how much a symbol is worth, so for example here the letter lowercase a is worth relatively little. It's very common, it's not so rare, and so it has a lower value than more rare symbols like for example the letter c or the letter b. Once I know how much a symbol is worth, I want to find some way of fairly valuing it when I encode it. I mentioned in the last lecture that we have a sort of fork in the road, which we have to now take one of the arms of the fork today, uh, and that is we have to decide how we encode our symbols. Once I decide um, that I want to encode each symbol in a number of bits that fairly values that symbol, the question is, I guess, do I encode every symbol in a vacuum? So do I give every symbol its own, its very own bit sequence, and then encode each symbol separately and combine everything together? Or do I find some way of mixing symbols together? And we're gonna take the fork in the road that corresponds to this technique today and in the next few lectures. And we'll notice that that does lead to a certain amount of, I guess, rounding error or inaccuracy. There are certain aspects of the fractional values that I get from my information content that I can't realize very well if every bit sequence, if every uh, symbol gets its very own bit sequence. So that's one arm of the fork in the road. We'll come back to the other arm of the fork in about five or six lectures. All right, so here's a piece of text, and you'll notice that this piece of text uh, is probably full of dependencies. This is English text for one thing, but it's a specific collection of English words that probably have a few repeating patterns and stuff. And we understand that that means that if we try and apply some of the techniques in the previous lecture, so we can still compute information count and the first order entropy, but we understand that the more dependencies exist, the less accurate the bounds that we have are going to be. We also know, however, that there are techniques that exist, so LZW is one that we've already seen, that allow us to remove dependencies in a sequence and in a sense make the sequence more independent. In any event, in this lecture, I'm not going to worry about the dependency problem. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about sequences of symbols and their information content. So I have the sequence of symbols. Here is the frequency of um, the occurrence of each symbol. Notice that, for example, R appears a lot and lowercase u doesn't appear so much. 
I can compute the self-information of each symbol. The first order entropy, now the slides are actually being very magnanimous and saying first order entropy here. I believe after this slide, I'm never gonna say this again. I, I might say it vocally, but I'm not gonna put it in the slides. From now on in this course, if I talk about the entropy and I don't qualify that in any other way, I always mean the first order entropy that includes on exams. So the first order entropy of the sequence is 3.07 bits. And remember that one way we should interpret that is if we were to think of this sequence as a bunch of independent observations of the same distribution, the first order entropy tells me the expected number Number of bits of information I would get if I were to make one more observation. So in a sense, if I were to sample the distribution one more time, then I'd be um, essentially sampling it based on these the probabilities derived from this frequency table. The number of bits of information is a sort of weighted average of the information content of each symbol weighted by the probability that that symbol will appear. Uh, now we can I guess cycle through, just to remind ourselves of all the techniques that we know, we can cycle through a few ways to try and achieve compression here. So one, but one that I think by now we're, we understand is not gonna be that productive, is we could do a general bit reduction. So there are 10 distinct characters. So of course, if I represent each character in eight bits, I'm maybe wasting some space. So I could just encode every, uh, character in four bits. So each symbol is encoded in four bits. We know that that introduces overhead, but just for the sake of, of having a comparator, we could try that. The problem is, even if we have some clever way of avoiding the overhead, of avoiding having to explain to the decom decompressor what I'm doing, there's still the issue that it doesn't feel like using four bits is fairly valuing each symbol. So many symbols don't contain four bits of information. So this is the one that my mind goes to immediately. R is two bits of information. We can argue that all these 3.58s are basically four bits. Maybe we have to round up. We'll come back to that at the end of this lecture. Um, and then there are some symbols that are above four bits. So there are gonna be, if I use four bits for every single symbol uniformly, there are gonna be some symbols that get overvalued. So R ends up costing a lot more than it should. And some symbols that come at a discount. So S is actually more than four bits of information, but I'm actually achieving a savings, which isn't a good idea for compression because it's great to represent something in fewer bits than I need. The problem is I need S so little that it's not really worth achieving a discount on S if it comes at the expense of R being overpriced. Now the slides are pointing out what we already know. Thank you, slides. Um, so our idea, obviously, and I think this is a bit patronizing at this point, our idea, of course, is that I want to use a different number of bits to encode each symbol. And ideally, I would like the number of bits to be as close as possible to the information content of that symbol. Uh, and I understand because of that we're taking one particular fork in the road, if I choose to encode each symbol separately, then of course there are gonna be rounding errors. So for example, I might be able to represent, I don't know, let's do lowercase a is 0010. Okay, well that's not 3.58 bits, it's four bits, but I get it. I mean, if I have to choose a discrete number of bits, clearly I have to be using either three or four, so maybe we use four. If I'm lucky, maybe R can get exactly two bits. It happens to have an information content that is a whole number. Um, and because I'm representing each symbol separately, I have to settle for that. There are clever ways that we'll see much later in the course that allow us to uh, break this requirement and instead sort of mix the encodings for symbols together. And I'm stating that in a very vague way because it's an entire lecture worth of, um, of explication before we understand what I mean by that. We'll come back to that later. One thing I want to observe right at the beginning here, however, is that really I don't care that much if I wanna realize this, if I want to achieve this goal, I don't care that much exactly what the bit encoding looks like. So all it says is use a different number of bits with that number approximating the information content. So to be clear, one underlying assumption underneath this lecture and the next one is, I just want some way of representing, let's say B in three bits. I don't care which three bits you give me. It makes no difference to me. I just want some encoding that works for the entire set of symbols that realizes each symbol in as few bits as possible, obviously, but also with the number of bits reflecting its information content. So if some symbol needs five bits and some symbol needs two, I would rather that R get two and S get five. Okay, so I have that. But one key thing to understand is I don't actually care what specific bit encoding we use. I just care about the length of the bit encoding. Um, and the slides are also now repeating something that I already said. So I guess I'm getting a bit ahead of myself this morning. 
Uh, so the entropy, the first order entropy, gives the ideal average number of bits per symbol under the assumption of independence. And we understand in this sequence there probably are dependencies. That doesn't mean that the entropy is useless. It just means that whatever lower bound we come up with isn't really an absolute lower bound. The lower bound we defined last time, which was n times h of s, only is the true lower bound under the assumption of independence. And even then, only in a sort of long-term sense. Because inside of any finite sequence, you can usually identify some dependence that occur sort of naturally. Um, and so just because that lower bound doesn't apply fully doesn't mean we can't use the entropy as a measurement. Uh, in a sense, um, having dependencies makes the problem easier, which means it should be easier for me to realize this lower bound or maybe even exceed it given that I can leverage dependencies. So the entropy is 3.07 bits. Um, and that means that if under that assumption of independence, the optimal encoding for the sequence will use 3.07 bits per symbol if I encode this entire sequence. So that's the average number of bits um, per symbol for this sequence. And that means I should be able to encode the sequence in an ideal world, at least in theory, in 73.77 bits. Now, if I were to use a fixed 4-bit encoding, just as a comparator, it would be 96 bits. So I guess what I want to do over the course of this lecture is find some way of getting further from this and closer to this. Um, I'm willing to concede that I probably can't do actually 73.77 bits. That's impossible. I'm also willing to concede that even 74 bits might be unrealistic. I want to get to, I don't know, 76, 80 bits, something like that. I want to be verging on this number versus that one, with the idea that whatever technique I use probably generalizes pretty well as the sequence gets longer and longer, because the techniques we saw last time are based on distributions, not specifically a sequence of a short length. So whatever technique I come up with will probably still pay dividends even if my sequence gets longer and longer, as long as my distribution remains the same. Um, one thing I should observe is we've talked about lots of different encoding schemes of ways of turning symbols into bits so far, um, but they've all fallen into pretty much two buckets. We've either been encoding every symbol into the same number of bits, um, so the Unix Compress tool does that. The Unix Compress tool encodes every symbol into nine bits. No matter how often the symbol occurs, it will use nine bits. Although I guess later it does choose to use 10 bits so that the length of each symbol's encoding changes over time, but it doesn't change based on the properties of the symbol, just based on the state of the compressor. So compress uses nine bits, then eventually 10, then 11, then 12. But at any given moment, every symbol is encoded into the same number of bits. We have seen a couple of ways of using a variable number of bits. So one example would be I could encode numbers into unary. So here is the number three encoded into unary. And here is the number four encoded into unary. All right, and you notice that of course I'm using a different number of bits. Uh, and this is great, although it doesn't map that well onto what I want to do here because unary is sort of designed, or in our context we can think of it, the purpose of unary as being a way of using fewer bits for numbers with a smaller magnitude. There's a sort of absolute ordering imposed by unary. Unary is really convenient for that. It has some inherent inefficiencies. So, I mean, consider representing the number four in base two, I would not need five bits for that. Um, we saw compromise techniques that do use a variable number of bits, but avoid the inflation, I guess, that you get from unary um, at the expense of extra complexity. So one thing we saw back in lecture number five is this mixed binary unary representation. And that, that's a way of representing, of leveraging some of the sort of condensed representation of binary, but with the flexibility to use any number of bits in my binary representation. So then at value 13, which I can store in a four bit number in base two, I could represent with this mixed binary unary technique by first telling the decompressor, how many bits am I gonna need? Well, this is gonna be four bits. And then I give a four bit expansion of uh, the value 13. And that is a variable number of bits. What I will call your attention to is in both of those techniques, um, the, the length of the bit encoding was somehow built in to the encoding. So in unary, it's pretty easy to know how long a particular symbol's encoding is because you know when you've hit a zero, you're at the end of the encoding. In this mixed binary unary thing, it's not that obvious, but on the other hand, once you write the decompressor, once you write some way of decoding, it's pretty clear you always know exactly how long each symbol's encoding is. First, you count how many bits the binary part will have. In this case, it's four. Because that's in unary, you know when you've reached the end of the unary value, and then you just eat up four more bits. So it's really easy to know where one symbol ends and the next begins. 
The techniques we saw in the previous lectures, though, don't seem to work that well. They don't map on that well to this idea because if we use unary as an example, there is only one unary encoding that has a particular bit length. So, I mean, if we count up in unary, there's zero, there's one, there's two, there's three. There's only one unary encoding with a particular bit length. And unary has that sort of inherent inefficiency where because of the simplicity of the encoding, there's a bit of inflation. What I want here in this table is a, a little bit more flexibility than that. I want to maybe give R a two-bit encoding, but I'd like to be able to give out more than one three-bit encoding. Maybe B gets three bits, maybe E gets three bits. Um, maybe even we could give one of these 3.58s three bits too. So I want more flexibility than unary would give me. <clears throat> the mixed binary unary thing also is a bit tough because it's sort of hard to reverse engineer the set of bit sequences that I would need. And moreover, because it's designed for numerical data, I'd have to also work out a conversion, which seems like that would be a bit complicated. Um, so here's, uh, just for the sake of the next couple of examples, here is a set of symbols, a, a sequence with a, a much more skewed distribution where it becomes, I guess, a lot more urgent that I find some way of using a different number of bits per symbol. Um, so in this case, for example, I want A and B, ideally, to be represented in two bits, maybe even C. Uh, and then I'm willing to have these four be represented in a larger number of bits. Maybe not always five or six. Maybe if I'm lucky, I could find a way of representing E, F, and G in only four bits. But I can sort of see where my priorities lie here. And I think to myself, okay, so I want to use a variable number of bits per symbol. I'm not representing numerical data, so why don't I just assign bit sequences? Okay, A can be, you know, like, why not just try it out? Is this really a hard problem? So uh, here, how about this? I've just come up with a way of encoding um, each of my symbols into a number of bits, and I've tried to use as few bits as possible. Okay, great. So I use two bits for the higher frequency letters, the ones that have lower value, lower information content, and hey, I was lucky. I managed to use three bits for all the other ones. Okay, great. And the question is, is this a problem? Are we likely to get ourselves into trouble here? And I mean, on the one hand, if the answer were no, then I guess the lecture is over, which is great. We're done. We can go out and enjoy the sunshine. On the other hand, when have I ever finished a lecture after 17 minutes? Um, I think we're, we're not quite done yet. Maybe buckle up. So this isn't really that obvious. And maybe you can tell this is almost a sort of troll example. It's not going to work. Um, but let's just try it. Let's approach it in good faith. I would say, how about this? If this is such a great scheme, if it's this easy, then just go right ahead and decompress this. It's only six bits. Give me a break. This is a fourth year course. You can handle six bits, right? Yeah, of course you can. So I'd look at this and say, okay, 101. Huh, 101 looks a lot like an F. Okay, there we go. And, oh, 001. Well, okay, 001 is obviously a D. All right, problem solved. I did it. It's obviously FD. The problem is, if somebody else were to stare at this, if they were to pause the video or, or mute the commentary, they might stare at this and say, actually, you know what? Hmm, one zero. Okay, I think I'm done. One zero, yeah, that's a C. Okay, one zero again. Yeah, that's another C. And then zero one, that's a B. Huh, okay, so it decodes to CCB. That's a little bit worrying because now I've got one bit sequence and my decompressor doesn't exactly know what my input was. I compressed my input to this six-bit sequence, I gave the decompressor my decoding table, and it can't figure out the difference, which means I don't have lossless compression. That's a problem. So the problem here is that variable length code words make it a lot harder to differentiate, um, to, to turn our, our sequence of bits into a sequence of chunks that correspond to symbols. It's very hard to know where one symbol ends and the next one begins. Consider the fact that we never even thought about this with fixed length code words. If all of my code words had length three, then it's really easy to take my sequence of bits, my bit stream, and to, uh, I guess, break it up into individual symbols. Because I know where the first symbol ends, it's going to end after three bits. So I parse the three bits, I figure out what they decode to, and then I'm done. And then I just work on the next symbol. Um, it's also pretty easy to do this if I'm using a scheme like unary. Um, so if I'm using unary, it's really obvious where one symbol ends and the next symbol begins because that zero tells me I'm at the end of a symbol. Now, the reason why unary has that benefit actually is the same reason we're going to get to later in the lecture, a more general condition that we're building to in this lecture. Um, but uh, for now, notice that unary had that convenience and we never uh, gave it a second thought.
It just seems to work. In this case, we can't just go around handing out bit sequences, because if we do that, we run the risk of creating ambiguity. And although I'm willing to settle for a lot of trouble in this course, although I'm willing to write compression tools that take way too long or use lots of memory if I have to, one thing I absolutely cannot abide is a situation where the decompressor doesn't know what the data is, because we know that is our fundamental criteria for a scheme to be valid. So at the very minimum, what we want is a uniquely decodable encoding. At this point, I would sacrifice just about everything else for that. I don't mind if it takes a long time. I don't mind if I need a complicated algorithm, whatever. I need there to be only one way of decoding a particular sequence. We'll see, though, that we might maybe demand better. So let's try this. Here is a mapping I've come up with that is uniquely decodable. And suppose that I have now created some encoding. Here are eight bits of this encoding. Now we can use our imaginations here and suppose that I make an encoding where it's a, the result is a thousand bits long and I begin sending you those bits and you're the decompressor. And it could be a thousand, it could be a million, whatever, but you receive those bits one at a time. And remember that by our streaming requirement, although you're allowed to wait until you have eight bits saved up, or a hundred bits, or a thousand bits, at some point, if you receive bits um, one after the other, you have to begin decompressing. You can't wait for the entire input stream to come in before you start decompressing, because the input stream could be so long that you don't have enough memory to store it. And also, the people waiting for decompression could be getting impatient. If we're doing streaming, true streaming decompression, the bit sequence could, in a sense, have an indefinite length. I could be compressing, let's say, video data or something, and sending it to you for years at a time. And meanwhile, people want to watch TV. They actually want to see the decompressed output. So the idea is you want to begin decoding um, whatever data you've been sent sometime soon. Whether it's after 8 bits or 5 bits or 100 bits, you want to start decoding. So I've made this 8-bit message. But suppose I only have sent you the first 6. So you're receiving it one bit at a time, and you've only received six of the eight bits. And you have no way of knowing in advance how many bits there are going to be. So you've received six bits, and you stare at it, and you say, okay, well, from what I can see so far, I don't know how many more bits there are, if any. From what I can see so far, if the message stopped right here, it would obviously have to be A and then D. Obviously, because uh, once I've received six bits, there's only one way to break this up into symbols evenly. The problem is, if you don't know whether you're getting any more bits, well, if you were to get more bits, maybe it decodes differently. So for example, suppose you receive one more bit. Well now, I guess it's, okay, well there's A, and then this next bit sort of has to be E, assuming that that's the end of the message. On the other hand, now I'm, I'm a bit suspicious, because if I keep receiving bits, the decoding could change. So actually this could be A and then E, but it could also be, I guess this could be the B, followed by, I don't know, this could be the beginning of a C. Huh, that's a little bit worrying. Until I know that there are no bits left in my message, I really can't draw any conclusions about how I decode it. So then you send me one more bit, okay? And then it turns out, if this really were the end of the message, then it turns out the message decodes to B and then C. Huh. But even worse, if you don't know that this is the end of the message, it could still be, well, there's A and then there's D. And then, for all you know, the next bit, if I send one more bit, it's going to be a zero, and that's D. And maybe you can see the real significant problem that we're going to have here, which is the more bits you receive, um, you know, the more likely the, the encoding will change over time. And notice how the changes propagate all the way backwards. So it's one thing if you need to wait for a few more bits to know what the next character is, or maybe the last two characters. But if you generalize this example, you could uh, consider a situation where you're sitting here and you've received 10,000 bits. And based on whether this thing is a zero or a one, the entire decoded message could change. So notice that when I was at sitting at eight bits, um, I thought the message was BC. And then you add one more bit and the entire message changes. The first character changes. I have to go all the way back and start again. That's not great. It's better than nothing. I am, there is only, uh, one way to decode a particular fixed sequence of bits. Once you've given me all the bits, there's only one way to decode it with this encoding table. The problem is the uncertainty makes this really difficult to decode um, in general, but certainly in a streaming way. 
So I would rather not have to work with schemes like this. And it turns out I don't have to. It turns out that um, the condition we're about to state is something we actually can achieve. So although this is uniquely decodable, it doesn't allow for us to achieve our streaming condition. I want to be able to, to actually start my decoding before I've received all of the input, because the input could go on for a very, very long time. There's also something worth observing, which we're not going to belabor in this course, which is that it does seem like the obvious algorithm for doing this decoding is some kind of like recursive backtracking algorithm. That is, I have to uh, consider every possibility propagating all the way back to the beginning, and I might make a mistake and have to start again. Maybe I could use dynamic programming for that, but all in all, it looks like a pretty nasty algorithmic headache. Um, there's this question, just for completion's sake, something to think about later, which is, if I want to do this decoding, what's the complexity? And there are all sorts of weird um, parallels in my mind that come up when I think about this problem, this idea of the entire sequence propagating backwards based on the next bit that I see. Um, for those of you that are theory people, you might, for example, consider an odd parallel. It's not the same, but an odd parallel between this problem and things like post's correspondence problem, something that, uh, well, the complexity of post correspondence problem is uh, really nasty. It's much worse than a complexity problem at that point. So we'll leave that there. Um, what I want to do, though, is define what it means for a code to give me that streaming thing that I want. And we call that code instantaneous. So a code is instantaneous if, uh, when you send me the bit sequence and I walk left to right across those bits, I am able, as soon as I recognize a symbol, I know that it must be that symbol. I, I know that whatever bits I've seen, once I recognize a symbol, that symbol is permanently going to be in my output sequence. So in this example, which where this doesn't really hold, I, what I want is the ability to say, okay, there's a zero. I, I don't recognize anything so far. Okay, zero, one, no, still no. Oh, zero, one, zero, that's an A. And as soon as I recognize a symbol, as soon as I see something in my table, it's always going to be an A. This will never change. So I only have to worry about decompressing the remaining bits in the sequence. Um, so this code is instantaneous. Um, and that means that once I see the bits 0, 1, 1, I know that I am looking at the symbol A, which means I can now dispose of these bits. I never need them again, so I don't need to keep them. And I can output A, and I am done. I just wait for more bits to come in. Uh, and that's obviously nice. Now, what I want to call our attention to is maybe why that is. Let's see if we can make some observations uh, for why this code is instantaneous and this one isn't. So first, once I see 0, 1, 1, is there any chance that that's the beginning of a different symbol and not just a full A? Well, back in this code here, when I see 0, 1, 0, well, that could be an A, I guess, but it could also be the beginning of a B. And the reason is because the encoding for A is a prefix of the encoding for B. Notice that in this encoding table, the encoding for A is not a prefix of the encoding for anything else. They certainly all have bits in common, but there is no encoding that begins 0, 1, 1. So if I see 0, 1, 1, I must be looking at an A. Um, this is a code that is not quite instantaneous. So if I see 1, 1, 1, well, that could be an A, but it could also be a B because based on what the next bit is, this, this could be a B, I, I guess, if the next bit is a zero. It also could be an E. Okay, so this is uniquely decodable, but it's not instantaneous because I need more characters before I understand what I'm actually looking at. So it's not instantaneous, I don't want that. Even in cases where I could design a uniquely decodable encoding where I could resolve the ambiguity quickly, or where I could um, strike some compromise, like I could say, I'm gonna send you only 100 bits, a, a chunk of 100 bits at a time. I'm not gonna let the sequence go beyond 100 bits. I'll just send you multiple packages of bits so you don't have to backtrack through potentially an incredible long sequence of bits. I don't like that. I like this left to right idea. I want an encoding that lets me walk from left to right. As soon as I recognize a symbol, that symbol is done. I can dispose of those bits and never worry about them again. That's the streaming that I want to achieve. And maybe we can see it does seem to have something to do with prefixes. So as long as in my encoding table, there is no case where one encoding is a prefix of another, then I seem to be good. Because then if I see that encoding, I know I'm dealing with that symbol. So I guess what I want is what's called a prefix-free code. 
So a prefix free code is an encoding scheme in which the encoding of one symbol will never ever be a prefix of the encoding of some other symbol. It's fine for them to be a suffix. So for example, in this case, C, the encoding for C is a suffix of the encoding for G, but I don't care because I'm gonna go from left to right. Uh, all I care about is if you show me a one zero in my input sequence, well, that's a C and I'm done and I can begin parsing the next symbol. Uh, and so I, I achieve my streaming decoding. So we call such a thing a prefix free code. And you can observe that one relatively brute force technique for checking if a code is prefix free, like if I told you to write an algorithm to do this, what you could do is just loop over all pairs of symbols and compare their encodings. Just make sure that no encoding is a prefix of another. Okay, there's that. Have I mentioned today that life isn't fair? Um, so uh, yeah, it turns out that prefix free codes for the sake of brevity, I guess, for the sake of gatekeeping and just being annoying, um, for the sake of confusing people. For some reason, prefix-free codes are commonly called prefix codes. So what we have here is a situation, we've got a sort of inflammable and flammable situation happening here. So inflammable and flammable both mean the same thing in English. Sorry about that, life's not fair. Prefix codes are actually prefix-free codes. Sorry about that, life's not fair. I wish that we could just say prefix free codes for the rest of the course, but there's only so much about the real world that I can protect you from, I'm afraid, and this isn't one of them. Everybody says prefix codes, so we're gonna have to say prefix codes too. It's gonna come up everywhere in this course, so I suppose if you can't beat them, you might as well join them. So when I say prefix code, I mean prefix free code, I'm so sorry. And you'll notice even in the title of this lecture or the title of this slide, I'm already doing that. I'm just saying prefix code. Um, so, all prefix codes are instantaneous, and it actually turns out we could write a proof that the word instantaneous is actually a synonym for prefix free. Um, and so, it turns out any instantaneous code must be a prefix code if it's really instantaneous, and all prefix codes are instantaneous. So, they actually mean the same thing. I like saying prefix code or prefix free code because I feel like that's a more descriptive term. And I think generally society agrees with me. I think the term instantaneous code doesn't come up as often. So the question is, how can we tell? If I give you an encoding table, how can you tell if it's prefix free? And I already answered that. I said what you could do is just loop over all pairs of symbols. But what if the encoding table is massive? Um, is there a faster way? And I'll concede that we know already that our encoding tables don't tend to be that large. So why do I care that much? Actually, it's an excuse to talk about binary trees because I love binary trees. So I want to talk about a clever faster algorithm, not that we care that much about the fact that it's faster, a clever faster algorithm for deciding if a code is prefix free because it's a good way of, um, I guess, developing a new way of visualizing sets of binary sequences. So it turns out that if you give me an encoding scheme into binary, I can represent that by a binary tree. And what I'm building to is that there actually is a one-to-one -one correspondence. And moreover, it's not just about ways of encoding stuff. If you give me a list of binary sequences um, attached to symbols or not, I can turn a, any list of binary sequences into a rooted binary tree. I can visualize it that way. And I like doing that because this just feels easier to work with to me. And if you know me, you know that I have a background in graph algorithms and things, so maybe that's why. But I like trees. And I think you do too. So um, it turns out I can take this encoding table and draw it as a binary tree. And we can do this by noting a certain, um, I, I've drawn the tree over here, but we can note a certain property of navigation in trees that seems to be inherently binary. So suppose that I start at the root of this tree and I wanna walk to somewhere in the tree. Let's suppose I'm walking to this node here, the, the leaf that contains the symbol D. How do I get there from the root? Well, I guess I go right, then I go right, then I go right, then I go left. Okay, so to get to D, I do right, 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 left. What about to get to B? I guess I go left, then right. So that's left, right. And I observe that L and R are sort of arbitrary symbols. I'm speaking English and the words left and right are what I use. Isn't there something more universal I could use? I've got two choices, L and R. How about this? We'll just call L zero and R one. All right, and now it looks like I have a binary sequence. Now at each step, when I'm standing on a particular node of my tree, I actually have three choices. I can go left, I can go right, or I can stop. 
but that's reflected in the fact that these sequences have different lengths. So the length of the sequence tells me when I stop. When I run out of bits, that's when I stopped. And notice that, in, that if I pick any node, whether it's a leaf or not, any node inside my tree, I can describe that node by telling you how to get there. If I want to, if I want to talk about this node here, I can give you a pointer to the node, whatever a pointer means in this context. I can give you a pointer to the node, or I can just say, hey, you can get to that node by starting at the root and going right, right, right. In other words, one, one, one. So I can actually uniquely describe any position in a tree using a sequence of bits. And the length of the sequence tells me how far to walk, and the value of each bits, uh, the value of each bit tells me which direction to turn at each step. So for example, to get to G, I do right, right, left. And I can choose to represent right by a one bit and left by a zero bit. Connoisseurs will note that I don't actually have to do that. I could, I could flip it and have right be zero and left be one. Whatever, it's a convention. I just choose a bit to represent each direction. And so I can therefore put any set of binary sequences into a one-to-one -one correspondence with binary trees. Um, and of course, how I do a one to a full one to one correspondence isn't that relevant here. All I care about is I can build a sort of minimal tree based on any particular set of bit sequences uh, and then just label each node uh, by the path, uh, label nodes based on paths I take to get there. So if I want to know where G goes in my tree, I follow the sequence to get to G and then I label the node that I end up at with the symbol. Um, and I could do this to build a tree. So I could actually construct a tree based on some hypothetical encoding table. You may recognize this encoding table as the encoding from the very beginning of the lecture that had a problem, the encoding where FD and CCB decoded to the same thing. So if I want to take this, this encoding table and build the tree, what I do is I say, well, I'll just, I'll just take each encoding and add whatever nodes I need to my tree to make that encoding viable. So for A, well, how do I get to A? Well, I go right, then right. So I guess I need a root. I have to be able to go right from the root and then go right from there. So I just add nodes to my tree so that the paths that I'm describing over on the right become possible. So, okay, to add A, I do this. To add B, I need 0, 1, and so on. I just walk through and just add all the paths that I need. Um, and we know from earlier, this is an encoding that is not prefix-free. Um, and we can, we can demonstrate that to ourselves pretty easily. So the encoding for G is a prefix of the encoding for D. And the encoding for C is a prefix of the encodings for E and F. Notice also that in my tree, C and G sort of jump out at me for other reasons. Um, if I want to get to E and F, which we see in the table are prefixed by C, notice how getting to E and F requires walking through C. Notice how getting to D requires walking through G. And you can demonstrate to yourself pretty easily, I think, that that's because um, if I notice an internal node with a label, so something that isn't a leaf but still gets labeled, that means my, co my encoding isn't prefix-free. Because that means that the encoding of this symbol here will be a prefix of the encoding for these two symbols down here. And that gives us a really nice way of deciding if an encoding is prefix-free. And if I cared about running time, which I don't really care about in this example, I could build the tree in, in essentially, well, time linear in the total number of bits in the table which isn't so bad. Uh, and then I could just observe the nodes of the tree. If, if I notice any internal node that has a label that corresponds to a symbol, um, then the, the encoding is not prefix free. So an encoding is prefix free if and only if every single sequence um, terminates at a leaf. In other words, all of the labeled nodes are leaves. The reason I bring that up isn't so much because I want to write algorithms to detect whether something is prefix-free, although I can. It's because I think that if we can visualize prefix codes using trees, we can, uh, I don't know, cover more ground quickly because I, I feel like it's an easier visualization than just staring at binary sequences. Um, and so I guess the next question is, okay, given a set of symbols, we have an easy test for whether a, an encoding is prefix-free. Given a set of symbols, how can we construct some prefix-free encoding? Now, I don't just want any prefix-free encoding in general, but for now, I'll settle for that. Well, I think, you know, all I need for it to be prefix-free is for only leaf nodes to have labels. So if you give me some hypothetical set of symbols, so here, to be provocative, I've made sure my, some of my symbols actually are two characters long. Remember that a symbol can be any sequence of data, one character, two characters, a million characters, whatever. Um, so here's a set of seven symbols. I want a prefix code. Okay, well, I, I have seven symbols. I guess what I need is just any tree with seven leaves. So if I come up with seven leaves anywhere I want, 
So there are six, there's seven. And then I just join them together to make a tree. So there we go. Um, maybe we'll join these two like this. There we go. And then down here, we've got, I don't know, this is a little bit ugly, but we've got something like that. Okay, whatever. I just make a, a tree with seven leaves. So I could do that. The slides probably have a more organized way of doing that. I just build a tree with seven leaf nodes. Here it is. And then I just assign each node a symbol. There we go. And then I go backwards from my tree to figure out the encoding for each symbol. Great, I've done it. Now, this isn't really what I want. I mean, I don't just want some arbitrary prefix code because I could just make that up in advance before I have any symbols to begin with. Uh, what I want is a prefix code that also achieves my goal of fairly valuing each symbol. If I decide, for example, that the symbol AB occurs very often, so it has low value, low information content, I want AB to have a shorter encoding than a more rare symbol, like maybe XY. Currently, I don't have that. That is what I want to build to. So our goal is to design prefix codes. We do want prefix codes, um, but I want them in which each symbol's encoding has a particular length. And just like I said earlier, this is really important. Just like I said earlier, I have no investment whatsoever in what the actual bit sequence is. I don't care. Maybe later I will care. Maybe there are benefits to having a certain bit sequence full of zeros or ones or something, but for now I don't care. All I care about is uh, being able to say things like, I would like the encoding for A to have two bits, B to have, B, B to have four bits, C, D to have three bits, A, E to have two bits, and so on. I want to specify the length of the encoding. I don't care exactly what bit sequence I get. So let's see if we can, we have to formalize a couple more things. Let's see how we can achieve this. So I want to first formalize the problem that I'm actually trying to solve. So suppose that I have a set of n symbols. We'll call them a1 through an. And we'll notice very quickly this a1 through an sort of fades into the background. What I really care about is I have decided how long I want the encoding for each symbol to be. So I've made up a set of desired lengths, l1 through ln. And I've done this via whatever means I, I choose. So it doesn't matter at this point how I do this. Suppose I have four symbols, A, B, C, D, and the running example I'm going to use is, suppose I decide that A should have length three, B should have length one, C should have length two, and D should have length three. Now maybe I derive these numbers somehow based on the information content of each symbol. I decided that B is more common and should have a shorter encoding. Maybe that's how I did it, maybe I made them up randomly, who cares? At the moment, what I'm going to try and solve is the problem of once you have your desired lengths, how do I get the prefix code? And then we'll come back later in the lecture and find some way of figuring out how to make our lengths work properly. So these are our L values. There's L1, L2, L3, and L4. Um, one thing I'm going to do to make it easier to discuss this is without loss of generality, I'm going to assume that you have provided the lengths in ascending order. And the reason that that doesn't lose generality is what I'm really saying here is just renumber your collection of symbols such that all of the links appear in ascending order. Because you could easily reverse that. If you really want A to come first, well, just re renumber it for now and then later move A back up. Who cares? You can perform that transformation in your own time. So we can assume reasonably that if you give me some collection of symbols and their desired links, that the links have already been sorted into ascending order. If they're not sorted, just do that and then renumber them again later. Okay, so now in the, in the next few slides, actually the rest of this lecture, I'm going to assume that our length values, our symbols have been numbered such that the lengths are in ascending order. And there's nothing that precludes me from having the same length for every symbol. So I'm allowed to have every symbol, well, up to some conditions we'll state in a minute. I could give you a set of lengths that are all the same. The important thing is if the lengths are not all the same, they have to be specified in ascending order. So our question, now that we have a way of formalizing this, um, is there, uh, always, if you give me some set of length values, will there always exist at least one prefix-free encoding that encodes symbol, oh, this should say symbol AI, with a bit sequence, and I'm going to use SI for my bit sequences in this lecture, uh, into a sequence SI with the length that I gave. And I'm willing to be a little bit generous and say at least one prefix-free code. And the reason I say it that way is I understand that there are probably encodings I could make up with these lengths that clearly don't work. So I could make up a troll encoding here of, let's give B the encoding 0, C the encoding 0, 0, D the encoding 0, 0, 0, and A the encoding 0, 0, 1. Well, I mean, that does have the right lengths, but obviously it's not a prefix code. So I'm not going to try and make claims about whether every possible code is a prefix code, because clearly if I'm acting in bad faith, I can make up awful codes. 
What I want to ask instead is, if I give you a set of lengths, can you come up with one prefix code for that? I don't care what it is as long as it has those lengths. Uh, and so that's what we're moving forward with. Now, I'm also going to have to ask the question of whether I can make up deliberately bad choices of length for which no prefix code can exist. So the actual answer is no. It turns out if I give you a set of links, there is not always going to be one prefix-free code because I could give you links that make no sense. So I could say, here's L1, 2, 3, and 4, and for some reason I want to represent three different symbols by a one-bit sequence. Well, let's just try that out. Okay, so, so the encoding for symbol 1 will be 0. Okay, good so far. Symbol 2 is 1, and then obviously what am I going to do? There's no more one-bit sequences left. So it's impossible to create a prefix-free code for this sequence of links because there just aren't enough sequences of length one. Okay, but that might be an obvious, once you've seen it, maybe it's obvious why that one doesn't work. This one also doesn't work. So here, uh, length two, length two, length two. Okay, so let's try zero, 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 one, one, zero. But it turns out that it still doesn't work. It turns out that there won't be enough sequences available to me to, to compute three sequences of length three that work. Um, and it might not be as obvious to you why that is. And so I want to tackle that first. So the answer to our question from a few slides ago was um, no. There is not always, for any choice of length values, it is not always the case that I can give you a prefix-free code. So I suppose the next question is, well, what is a valid choice of length values? What do I need to do with my length values to make them work? Um, so here is a choice of length values. This is actually the example I already gave, so the case where my lengths are 3, 1, 2, and 3, but rearranged to put them in ascending order. Um, here is a set of lengths that does work, and I've given an example of a prefix code. Now, this prefix code turns out to be significant. You'll notice that it does seem to be in sort of ascending order. Notice how all the one bits happen down here. Um, but that's, uh, at this point, appear, apparently an arbitrary choice. If I wanted to, this would also work. I could actually flip all the bits and everything would still work. And there are a few other options as well. Who cares? We'll see in a few minutes there's an algorithm we can use where it is sort of helpful that it does compute a very standardized code, a code that sort of counts upward. But for now, all I want to observe is for this set of links, there definitely is at least one prefix-free code. So our question is, okay, there are some sets of links that do work and some sets of links that don't work. Can we characterize some kind of necessary condition or hopefully a sufficient condition? If I give you a set of links, I want to go from that set of links to a prefix code somehow or tell you, sorry, your set of links is invalid. I want some algorithm or some bound that I can use. Um, so what I want to observe, I want to tackle this intuitively. I'm not actually going to do a full proof. The result I'm building to, uh, there are tons of full proofs out there. So both of the books we're using actually have a full proof, I think. Um, but And there are other ways of getting a full formal proof in whatever level of detail you want. I want to justify this enough, this not being a theory course, I want to justify it enough that we understand why this works. Because the result we're building to is pretty important. So notice uh, in this encoding I've chosen that my encoding S1 begins with a zero. Well, I mean, it's just a zero. It begins and ends with a zero. That means, of course, that I'm not allowed to start the encoding for anything else with a zero. In a sense, the encoding for S1 has captured all of the possible bit strings beginning with zero. They are no longer available for use. And similarly, S2 begins with one zero. That means I'm not allowed to start the encoding for S3 with 1, 0. That's not allowed because then it wouldn't be prefix free. So in that sense, um, the encoding for S2 has captured every bit sequence beginning with 1, 0. And there are, of course, an infinite number of bit sequences beginning with 1, 0. One case I want to make, and I'll make it in an abstract sense now, but I have a more concrete way of visualizing it in a couple of slides. One case I want to make is that if I consider that all the bit se sequences beginning with 0 get captured by S1, and all the bit sequences beginning with 1, 0 get captured by S2, I want to make a sort of intuitive claim that there are more bit sequences beginning with, with 0 than there are beginning with 1, 0. I mean, if I consider all possible bit sequences in existence, so if we consider every possible bit sequence that exists, one way of visualizing this is to consider all ways of representing a real number between 0 and 1 in binary. So if I look at the, the real expansions in binary, so this is very scary to some of you, which is why I've got a more concrete visualization in a minute. If we consider the expansions of all real numbers in the range 0 to 1 in base 2, so there are bit sequences that look like this or whatever, they're just 
arbitrary bit sequences of zeros and ones that are infinite in length, um, then I would observe that all that half of all bit sequences in that range begin with a zero. Everything between zero and just before 0 0.5. Okay, so that means if I rule out every bit sequence beginning with a zero, I have ruled out one half of all possible bit sequences. If I rule out every bit sequence beginning with one zero, well, okay, so here's a bit sequence beginning with one zero, uh, here's the next one, and so on. Eventually, I'll, I'll hit bit sequences beginning with one one. So there will be a last bit sequence beginning with one zero. If I consider that I've ruled out all of those, well, then I've ruled out half of the remaining half of all bit sequences, that is one quarter. So the claim I want to try and justify, and not in this weird, scary, real numbers sense, because I know many of us don't have patience for that, the claim I want to justify is, if we consider that this encoding sort of reserves a bunch of bit sequences, it reserves more of them than an encoding with more bits. That's the claim I want to try and justify. So setting S1 to zero captures every bit sequ sequence beginning with zero, and those sequences are no longer available for use by other symbols. And the point I'm building to is this does give us a sort of natural upper bound on um, the total number of bit sequences that I can capture. I need there to be enough bit sequences left to go around for all of the other symbols that I have to encode. Um, to do this comparison without talking about the scary real number stuff that I've already crossed out, um, I want to, uh, I, I guess, try and put all of these bit se sequences on a common denominator, maybe. So what I'll do is I'll try and level the playing field so I can compare how many bit sequences get captured by each of these encodings. To do this, I will put them all on a level playing field by using the maximum length of any encoding. So with my links encoded into ascending order, the maximum length is always going to be the last length in my list. Um, so let's let h, let's define h to be the maximum length value. You might stare at that and say, wait a minute, what's h? Why did I choose h for that? What else could h possibly mean? Yeah, yeah, think about it for a minute. We'll come back to that. So let h be the maximum length value. So for this example here, h is equal to 3. Um, and then I'm going to, uh, let's, I guess, uh, conceptually, I want to consider all bit sequences of length h. So there are 2 to the h bit se sequences of length h, because h is equal to 3. Okay, I want to consider all of them. And then I want to consider uh, how each of my encodings factors into that entire collection. So here are all eight encodings, uh, all eight sequences of three bits. Notice that four of them get reserved by S1 because every bit sequence beginning with zero becomes unavailable once S1 has been encoded as zero. Okay, so that means that uh, four bit sequences get captured by S1. Two bit sequences of the eight available get captured by S2. Only one bit sequence gets captured by S3 and S4 because the length equals three um, and so nothing else gets captured. Whereas here in S2, the length equals two, which means there's one bit left over, but nobody's allowed to use any encoding beginning with one zero. What I want to do basically is count how many bit strings get captured by each encoding. I can do that here. So here there were four bit sequences captured, and I think, well, four, hmm, let's write that as a power of two. So two squared bit sequences get captured by the encoding of S1 with length one. Um, and then this is just two, or two to the one, encodings get captured by the encoding for S2. Notice also that we can figure this out pretty easily once we realize that all of those bits I'm not considering, if I'm working in three bits, well, one bit was taken up by the encoding, there are therefore two other bits left over. How many ways are, how many different encoding, how many different sequences of two bits are there? Two squared. When I do S2, there's one bit left over. How many different encodings of, how many different sequences of one bit are there? Two to the one. And when I use S3, there are zero bits left over, so S3 captures two to the zero bits, uh, bit strings, just one, just the, the single bit string of S3. And if I stare at it longer, I realize that actually the number I'm capturing is, can be quantified in terms of the total number of bits I'm working with, so the value of H, the maximum length, and um, the length of the encoding. So in the case of S1, the number of captured sequences is 2 to the h minus L1, so 2 squared. In S2, it's 2 to the h minus L2, so 2 to the 1. Uh, and one thing I'll observe is you, you might be wondering, why did I choose? That choice of h seemed almost arbitrary. I guess it makes some sense, but why am I just making up this idea of h being the maximum length of a bit sequence? One thing I'll point out is if you define h differently, so if you define h to be the maximum length value plus 1 or plus 5 or something, everything I'm talking about will still work. 
So I, I can't have h equal 2, because then how do I compare the impact of s3 and s4, which have length 3? But I could actually, for what I'm about to do, I could set h to be any value that's 3 or greater, because it turns out I'll just cancel h out of the equation I get to in a minute. So 2 to the h minus li bit strings get captured by each encoding. And I observe that for a set of lengths to work, there have to be enough bit strings available that every um, symbol gets to capture the right number of bit strings. So I know if I have a symbol whose length is one, I'm going to have to capture this number of bit strings. I also know that if I use up too many bit strings, then, I will, then there will be none left for everybody else. So for example, if the length of L2 was one, then every single bit string beginning with one would be captured. And that would be a problem because there would be no bit strings left over for L3 and L4. That is what I'm building to. The idea that I can use the total number of bit strings that each symbol captures as a way of figuring out whether a set of lengths is viable. And I do that like this. Um, if the number of bit strings captured by each encoding is this number, then I expect that the total number of bit strings captured across all symbols has to be at most the total number of available bit strings or else I'm in a lot of trouble. So I actually get this sort of neat bound. I expect for a set of lengths to be valid, this bound must hold. Now what I'm stating is a necessary condition. So maybe there are sets of lengths where the bound does hold that still aren't viable. Uh, but what I'm stating here is the condition that certainly if um, the lengths are viable, this bound has to hold. If the bound doesn't hold, the set of lengths isn't viable. Because if I need to capture more bit strings than I have bit strings, then I'm going to be in trouble. So the sum of the number of bit strings captured by each symbol has to be less than or equal to the total number of available bit strings. Now I can play with this for a bit. Um, so first, uh, let's just make sure it holds for the, the encodings that I already had. So if I add up the number captured, well, then I get 2 to the 2 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 0. That equals 8. And 2 to the h is 8. So the bound holds tightly at a quality. Um, this set of encodings here, which is a valid prefix code, although maybe I'm not, it's not as, I don't know, efficient or something as the other one because I actually have some bit strings left over, like 1, 1, 1, the bound holds here as well. So if I, if I add everything up, the bound comes to 7, which is less than or equal to 8. Okay, so uh, the bound holds for this as well. We'll see later, so in a couple of lectures, we will observe that in cases where this bound doesn't hold at equality, that's a sign that maybe I could, I could do something to make the encoding a little bit better. But it is still a valid encoding, and this is a valid prefix code. Um, this set of links that we saw earlier uh, doesn't satisfy the inequality. So I don't actually have encodings here because we couldn't come up with a prefix code, and it turns out that that's because it's impossible, because the bound doesn't hold. So if I add up the left-hand side of the bound, I get 9. And 9 is greater than 8, and therefore the bound is not satisfied, and that means this set of lengths isn't viable. There will not be enough bit strings to go around if I allow each symbol to capture the number of bit strings that it needs. Uh, and so that means no prefix code exists. So I now have a necessary condition. Um, I can also rewrite uh, this bound that I came up with to eliminate the dependence on h. So I mentioned if you're worried about h being arbitrary, don't worry about that because I can actually eliminate the dependence on h. What I do is just factor the h out of um, the left-hand side and then just divide both sides by 2 to the h. And notice that I end up with this very nice, elegant little inequality. It is a little bit harder to unpack it from this end. So the reason I derived it with h the way I did is that if I were to derive it from this expansion, that's where I have to begin talking, I think, about real numbers. And although in this course we are going to have to begin doing that eventually, real numbers in base 2, um, I want to put it off for a couple more weeks. So in any event, we had this bound that we derived using a pretty concrete derivation, and we can reduce it to this form, which is equivalent. And this form is called the Kraft-McMillan inequality. And in this course, we're going to work with it in, this, in these terms. We're going to keep talking about it in terms of this summation. We're not going to talk about h, because h is sort of clunky. It's an extra parameter that we don't need. And the Kraft-McMillan inequality is a necessary condition for an encoding to be uniquely decodable. It isn't a sufficient condition. And the reason for that has to do with that thing I mentioned earlier about this distinction between links and actual encodings. Um, if I have a set of links that, um, that for which the inequality is satisfied, then that means a prefix code could exist. We will prove in a few minutes that in fact, for a given set of links, if the inequality is satisfied, a 
some prefix code always exists. But one thing you have to be very careful about is just because if I give you one particular encoding and I show you that the inequality is satisfied, that doesn't mean the encoding is a prefix code because I could make up an encoding in bad faith. So an example is here's a code of length one, there's an encoding of length two, there's one of length uh, three, and there's another one of length three. Well, the links satisfy the inequality. That doesn't mean that I have a prefix code. There, there could be other factors in play. Uh, so it's possible to design encoding systems, this is one of them, um, that do satisfy the inequality but are not uniquely decodable. That's because the inequality doesn't know anything about the actual encoding, it just knows about the lengths. Um, so let's go back to our codes from earlier. This code from earlier, which wasn't uniquely decodable, has doesn't satisfy the inequality. The left-hand side comes to 1.38, which for completeness I will observe is greater than 1. Um, this code, which is not a prefix code, so it isn't instantaneous, but it is uniquely decodable, does satisfy the inequality. And a key thing, something that we're not going to worry too much about, is that um, for a code to be uniquely decodable, it must satisfy the inequality. The prefix code or not, it must satisfy the inequality to be uniquely decodable. Um, and now we can begin building further. So we have this necessary condition, um, but not a sufficient condition, but we can sort of turn it into one. If you give me a collection of links, so the links are in ascending order here, such that the inequality is satisfied, then there will exist some prefix-free code that realizes those links. Now, it doesn't mean that any code that has those links is a prefix code. It just means that if you give me the links, I can make you a prefix code with those links. This is a huge deal because what this is, once we justify this claim, what this is essentially telling us is from now on, if I want a prefix code, all I need is to come up with good lengths. I don't have to worry about anything else because if I have a set of lengths that works and I don't care that much about the actual bit encodings, then I will always be able to create one. I should observe the theorem just says that a prefix code exists. I'm going to demonstrate the theorem. The theorem can be proved by construction. That means not only is there a prefix code, I can always create one because you could prove the theorem by designing an algorithm that actually computes the prefix free code. Uh, so the theorem can be proven by just making up an algorithm and proving the algorithm works. I'm going to show the algorithm. I'm not going to do the formal proof. Um, one could write a formal proof based on what I'm sketching out here, but I will qualify it by saying what I'm doing isn't formal enough to be an actual proof. I'm going to derive the algorithm via basically leveraging observations that we've already made, the observations that led us to that inequality. So basically what I'm going to observe is if we talk about this value of h, so um, if I take my set of lengths and I, can, I figure out the maximum length, which to be magnanimous is this value, although you might observe that if the lengths are in ascending order, it's just equal to ln. It's just the last length. That's going to be the, that has to be the maximum length. So I compute the value uh, of h and then I consider all bit strings of that length. So all bit strings in this case of length 3. Uh, what I could do is just walk through my lengths and my bit strings, iterate over all the bit strings of length 3, and then dish them out to each encoding. So I'd say, uh, and then skip over whatever number of bit strings each encoding captures. So what I might do is I would define a variable called b and set it equal to the bit string 0, 0, 0. At each step, I would ask, okay, so the next length is, oh, 1. So I guess I need a bit, uh, some encoding of length 1 for this symbol. Well, how about this? My current value of b is 0, 0, 0. I will take the most significant um, one bit from b, from b, which is this, and that'll become the encoding for the first symbol. And then I will increment b enough to skip over all of the bit strings that get captured. And to increment it, I already know how many bit strings get captured. It's going to be this number. So I get, I'll say b equals b plus 2 to the h minus l1. That would be 2 to the 2. So I then skip over, and the value of b at the beginning of the next iteration is going to be um, 1, 0, 0. Notice that by adding that particular power of 2, I'm installing a 1 bit in b. A and notice that also, because of the way that I'm computing this, h minus l1, the 1 bit that I'm installing will always sort of be on the left. The 1 bits don't tend to come in from the right, and that means that at each step, I actually can assume that the least significant few bits of b will be zeros as I keep going. Okay, so the next step, uh, b is equal to 100, zero, zero, and I notice that l2 equals 2. I need to come up with some encoding of 2 bits. Okay, well, I'll choose the most significant 2 bits of b, and then uh, s2 gets the encoding uh, 1, 0. Now I skip over all the sequences that are captured by s2, so b equals b plus 
2 to the h minus l2, which is going to be 2 to the 1. All right, so then I skip and b ends up equaling 1, 1, 0. So at the beginning of the next iteration, b is equal to 1, 1, 0. Notice that that installed another 1 bit into b, but it didn't touch that least significant bit. Again, the 1 bits seem to sort of show up more on the left-hand side, in the mo most significant columns, and that's because the links have been sorted into ascending order. Okay, at the next iteration, I say, now I need an encoding of length 3. Well, then I take the most significant 3 bits of b, and I assign them to be the encoding for the encoding S3. And then I do B equals B plus, well that would be 2 to the H minus L3, which would be 2 to the 0, which is B is now B plus 1. So I add 1 bit. And of course now finally the least significant bit of B is a 1 bit, but again notice how all the 1 bits that I brought into B were brought in sort of from left to right as I progressed through all of these things. And then in the final step I say, okay, L4 is equal to 3, let's come up with an encoding uh, of 3 bits, which is going to be 1, 1, 1. So that's the idea. I'm just iterating over all the binary sequences of length 3 and assigning um, a, a, a subsequence to each of my symbols based on the length that I was given, and then skipping over however many bit sequences I need to skip over to account for all the sequences that get captured by each symbol. And here's an algorithm that does that. Um, so I come in assuming that you give me the set of lengths and that they do satisfy the inequality and that they are sorted in ascending order. Both of those things are things you could easily verify before you call the function. I compute h, again in a very crunchy mathematical way, I use the max function, although as you might observe, if they're already sorted, you could just say h equals ln and save yourself a little bit of time. Uh, I then initialize a variable b, so I'm going to do, I've written the pseudocode in a way that uses actual arithmetic, so the plus operator, so I'm going to treat b as a binary number in, uh, that I interpret to be in uh, h bits, but it's just a number. Uh, at each step, I pull out a bit sequence for the next symbol, so this is the encoding si. I pull it out by taking the most significant li bits of my value b, and then I move b along to uh, skip over all the encodings that were captured by the sequence P, and then I keep going. Um, this algorithm is essentially what I just illustrated, but it also captures a lot of those observations we made earlier when we were talking about what it means to capture bit strings. Uh, this algorithm is also really important for other reasons, uh, because since there's a standard algorithm, if you give me a set of links, a standard algorithm to compute bit encodings, that means if I'm the compressor and I want to use some variable encoding of symbols, and I want the decompressor to have the same encoding, well, hey, I don't have to send the decompressor a table of A is 100, B is 101, C is 1, I don't have to do that anymore because what I could just do is send the decompressor all of my lengths. I could assume the decompressor has access to this algorithm. And that means if both me and the decompressor use this algorithm to compute our actual encoding, I don't have to tell the decompressor the exact encoding of each symbol, I just have to send over those length values. We'll come back to this at the end of the next lecture. This is actually a pretty big deal. Um, I would observe for the sake of your future study that um, when I talk about uh, bit se sequences like this, so if, suppose that B is equal to, I don't know, the value six, in three bits. When I number the bits, I number them starting at the least significant bit as bit zero, and then bit one, and then bit two. So the most significant bit would be bh. Uh, oh, actually, I guess in this context, maybe because we're doing things mathematically, I should number them starting at one. So when we, when we talk about things formally in math, we like using ones. When we talk about things in computer science, we like using zeros. We can figure it out, we can all get along. Um, and so at each step, that observation I made earlier about the trailing zeros, about where the one bits come from, um, that's coming from the fact that links are stored in ascending order. This observation, whether it's intuitive to you or not, isn't that important for later, but it is one, what we're really saying here is that when I go and assign bit se sequences, um, the canonical representative of each thing, so the value of B when I get to a particular symbol, will always end in a bunch of zeros, and those zeros are the ones that I cut off. When I actually choose the encoding, um, um, everything, all the bits that I don't use are, are actually going to be equal to zero at each step. That's just a, an interesting observation to make. One exercise to make sure that you're familiar with this algorithm, which we are going to need a lot in this course, um, is to see if you can modify this so that if you don't have this assumption, if links are in ascending order but you don't already know that they satisfy the inequality, 
Um, there's a way of detecting that. Just use the value of b in a clever way, and you can detect when the inequality is not satisfied somewhere in the middle of this loop. See if you can modify the algorithm to do that as early as possible. So if I give you links that don't satisfy the inequality, you bail out as soon as you notice that property, but without adding any extra loops. Just do it in the middle of the existing loop. So we could now go further and take this algorithm and then write a formal proof that, uh, be, that this algorithm will always work if the links satisfy the inequality. And that would be sufficient to prove the theorem from earlier. If we prove that the algorithm always works if the links satisfy the inequality, we have proven that there always exists a prefix code. I won't write that proof, but I will state that that is indeed true. This algorithm will do that as long as the links always satisfy the inequality. And that means we no longer care about finding specific bit encodings. Instead, as long as I can come up with links that satisfy the inequality, there is always a way, i.e. this algorithm, that will compute a prefix code for us. Um, I also want to talk, I want to swerve a little bit and talk about a way of interpreting that algorithm in terms of binary trees. Just in case my extremely illuminating way of talking about binary sequences wasn't your cup of tea, if you're more visual of a person, we can also talk about the algorithm, the same algorithm, but in terms of how, it would, how we could visualize it using a tree. Um, so let's get, here's our set of code links. Um, we'll compute the value of h. Hey, now I think I understand the whole point of that h uh, all, after all of this. Um, I'm going to construct a full binary tree of height h. And we'll notice that um, uh, if I consider all of the leaves of this tree, they will correspond to all possible binary sequences of length h. So for example, there's 1, 0, 1. That would be this leaf here. Uh, just a note, uh, here's a tree with just a root. This tree has height 0. Here is a tree with a root and two children. This tree has height one. So to be clear, when I talk about the height of a tree, uh, you can think of that as counting the number of edges between a root and the, lower, the lowest leaf. So there's one, two, three, um, not the number of nodes. There are four nodes between root and leaf here, but the height of a tree in my mind starts at zero with a tree that's just the root. And that means that we don't want to talk too much about what a tree looks like if it has no nodes at all. We'll just not worry about that for this course. Um, and also note this, this is relevant if you want to justify some of the things I'm going to say in passing in a couple of slides. Um, if I have a particular tree of height h, there are 2 to the h leaves. So that claim I made a couple minutes ago makes a bit more sense now. The leaves, um, the ones at depth h, correspond to all binary sequences of length h. And sure enough, there are 2 to the h of them, so that, that adds up. Uh, okay, so if I want to find a code word for L1, um, the value B in that algorithm from earlier, you can think of the value B as walking over all of these leaves. So at any given step of the algorithm, B refers to, is a way of sort of pointing at one of these leaves. It'll actually be the leftmost leaf in the subtree we end up assigning to each symbol. So at the beginning of the algorithm, B will be 0, 0, 0. It'll be this leaf here. Um, if I want to find a code word for L1, what I do is I locate the first node at depth L1, so that would be 1, um, in an in-order traversal of the tree. Or alternatively, in the context of the algorithm, I take my value of B and I find the ancestor of that leaf at depth L1. In either case, it's going to be this. So this is S1. Now, I realize that to be a prefix code, obviously this has to be a leaf node. So I go through and just delete everything underneath it. They're all captured, they get deleted. All right, and to do this, of course, if B is wandering through all the leaves, I guess I have to reposition B to be over here. Um, the number of things I skip over, so the leaves I delete, would actually be this number of leaves, 2 to the h minus L1. So if I'm advancing B along, I advance B by 2 to the h minus L1 steps to position it at this leaf here. So the bit sequence B now refers to this leaf. And then I want to come up with an encoding for um, the next symbol. So S2 goes here. So B is this. So I find the ancestor of B in the tree um, at depth 2. And that becomes S2. And then, of course, I have to delete both of the leaves underneath S2 so that S2 becomes a leaf. And there are 2 to the h minus L2 leaves. So B was here. I move B along, and now it's here. I skip over all of those leaves. Uh, OK, I get to the next step. Um, and then, obviously, the ancestor of B at depth 3 is just B itself. So this becomes S3, B moves over here, and then this becomes S4. If there were any more symbols, notice how I can't move B any farther, which means if there was an L5, which is set to 3 or something, then I would say, nope, can't do it. There is no prefix code, I'm out of nodes. The tree has no leaves left for me to reserve. If I fill in any remaining nodes, I wouldn't be creating a prefix code. 
And you'll observe the total number of nodes consumed is the same number we're used to. This is the left-hand side of the original derivation of the inequality. And if I were to cancel out h, sure enough, there's the left-hand side of the Kraft-McMillan inequality. And so you can actually visualize the algorithm in those terms. Um, so B is walking through the leaves on the lowest level of this notional tree. We're not, we, there's no sense in building a real linked tree here. We can just visualize the algorithm in terms of that tree. At each step, I find the ancestor of B at depth Li, and that becomes the that is the node that represents the encoding for Li, so Si. And then I skip over all those leaves that get deleted. I skip over the leaves that got captured. So that would be once I've decided this is S1, these things have to be deleted, so I have to skip over all of them, and I know that there are this number of them. And that's what that incrementation step of the algorithm is doing. Okay, it's Im I think it's pretty important that you have some intuitive grasp of this algorithm because we need to use it. We're going to rely a lot on this canonical construction of prefix codes. The idea that we don't actually need to send you a prefix code. If we can both agree on an algorithm to compute a prefix code, all I need to do is send you the lengths. And if we both use the same algorithm, we can recover the code just from the lengths. Um, now the question is, okay, so if it's all about computing links, how do I come up with a good set of links? So what I want is, suppose you gave me a sequence of symbols. So again, think back to the very beginning. I've got a sequence of symbols where some symbols are worth more than others. So in this sequence, C is worth a lot. C is rare and therefore has a high information content. A is worth very little. What I would like to do is come up with a set of code lengths. So maybe A has length 1, B has length 2, and I don't know, C also has length 2? Maybe C has length 3? I want to find some way, some orderly way of coming up with a set of lengths for a bunch of symbols, whether it be three symbols or a million symbols, um, that satisfies the inequality. Once I have a set that satisfies the inequality, I will be able to make a prefix code. I, of course, also want a set of lengths that's chosen I don't know, judiciously, chosen well so that the length of each symbol's encoding is as close as possible to its information content, because that seems to be the direction I need to go to reduce the total size of the sequence to its entropy. I want to do a couple of things to formalize stuff. So we know that when we talk about entropy, like we did in the last lecture, we're talking about it in terms of distributions. We're talking about it in terms of probabilities. So for the sake of, I want to go from a um, sequence of symbols. I guess I shouldn't have cleared that so soon. I want to go from a sequence of symbols to something that I can talk about in terms of probabilities. So what I'll do is I'll say, here's my sequence S of N symbols, and this is the alphabet. So in the example I actually have written, the alphabet is just A, B, C. What I will do is now count the number of times I see each symbol. So CI is the number of occurrences of symbol AI inside my sequence. If I treat symbols as independent, that is to say, if I view this as me having sampled a bunch of the same distribution over and over again, um, the distribution I have observed, because that's all I know about the sequence is what I've observed, the distribution I've observed puts the probability of seeing a particular symbol at just the number of times I've already seen it divided by the total number of things I've seen. So I can estimate the probability of the next symbol being a, I guess, being a C. So, well, the probability of C would be 1 divided by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So the probability of the symbol being a C is just 1 over 9 by this uh, way of viewing it. So, so the probability of this being a C is 1 over 9. I can do that. Um, by defining probabilities this way, I will observe that this covers all of the possibilities, and if I add up all the probabilities, they therefore do add to 1. Um, now, recall the definition of entropy. So the definition of entropy of a sequence, so this is first-order entropy, although you can see the slide isn't saying that because it doesn't have to anymore. The first order entropy of the sequence is the average number of bits in each symbol weighted by the probability of each symbol occurring. Another way of thinking about that, if I want to talk about it in terms of this idea of sampling a distribution is, suppose I have a sequence and I'm asking a question of, if I make one more observation, how many bits do I expect to see? Well, the number of bits I expect to see is the weighted average of the number of bits of information in each symbol weighted by the, the number of the frequency or the probability of that symbol occurring. That is, A might have a very low amount of information, but because it's so common, it will drag down that weighted average. So this is the formula for entropy from the last lecture. One other thing I'll observe, which I also did in the last lecture, is this is equal to um, the, the weighted average of the probability of each symbol multiplied by the information content 
of that symbol. The information content is negative log base two of the probability. And so if I just move the negative sign over, we can see that that's the expansion that I get. Uh, I want, ideally, I guess, the average number of bits per symbol to be h of s. On the other hand, I also understand that in a setting where I have to encode each symbol into a whole number of bits, there's going to be a little bit of drag. There's going to be a little bit of a rounding error. So if a gets two bits, or if a gets one bit, and b gets two bits, and c gets two bits, well, if the actual information content of b is 1.3 or 1.7, obviously two bits isn't quite going to do it. What I want to do is define a sort of equivalent measurement for this type of encoding. And I'm going to call it L bar, the, the weighted average length of um, each symbol's encoding. And the idea there is, again, what I want to do is think about if I'm encoding a, a sequence, and it's so A, B, and so on, and I say, suppose I'm going to encode one more symbol. What is the number of bits I expect to need for that one more symbol um, based on whatever encoding scheme I've come up with? So A is equal to 1, B is equal to 0, 0, C is equal to 0, 1. So this is sort of a way of applying the definition of entropy to the specific case where each symbol has a fixed number of bits in its encoding. So you'll notice that, that H is defined in terms of the information content, and L bar is defined in terms of the actual number of bits in, into which I encode the symbol. My goal, though, is to make L bar, the real average number of bits, as close as possible to the ideal number, the average number of bits. And so that's our goal. Actually, our, our real goal, I mean, if we want to be really bombastic, our goal is to make L bar go as close to zero as possible. I would like to represent my sequence in as close to zero num bit bits as I possibly can. Now, that's way too ambitious. So our goal is to make L bar less than or equal to the entropy. Um, in general, I should expect there to be a certain drag because, obviously, if code links have to be integers, that means I don't get to take advantage of some of the fractional stuff that comes out of information content. And, obviously, I cannot expect, in general, to exceed the entropy under my assumption of independence. Remember from the very beginning of this lecture that that lower bound, that entropy, that first order entropy gives us, can be exceeded. I can go below that lower bound if I don't have independence. For sequences with dependencies, I have ways of going below the lower bound because the lower bound only applies for independent sequences. However, in our context, we will assume we're working with independent stuff. So there's the word independent. So in that context, I am not allowed to go below the entropy. So L bar, which is ideally going to get as close as possible to the entropy, but never, but is unable to go below it, obviously, L bar will be greater than or equal to H of S. So the question is, can I, how close can I get? And there are, I guess I want to approach that in two stages. So in this lecture, I want to show this result. There is a way, if you give me a set of code links that satisfies the inequality, um, uh, or sorry, once you give me a set of code links, I can make a prefix code. Uh, there is a set of code links. Once you give me a sequence and you give me its distribution of symbols, I can create a set of code links that puts L bar, the average number of bits per symbol, um, within one of the entropy. So if the entropy ends up equaling, I don't know, 2.1 bits per symbol, I can get L bar at most 3.1. And that's pretty good. I'm pretty close to the entropy. That's certainly better than 20 bits per symbol. But hopefully you can observe, you know, in the context of compression, 3 bits versus 2 per symbol is a pretty big deal. That's almost one third more. So although I can get L bar to within one bit of the entropy, L bar is an average. L bar does not actually have to be a whole number. Although I can get L bar to be within one bit of the entropy, that does still leave us a little bit of room. Maybe I can get closer than that. But this theorem is still a really big deal. And I will demonstrate this result. Maybe it's not a full proof. I will demonstrate this result with a construction. So this construction satisfies the theorem. I am able, actually, no, this is sort of a proof. I am able to uh, demonstrate that L bar will be this close to the entropy. There is a way uh, of generating code links based on my distribution that gets me within one bit of the entropy. However, there are algorithms that can do better. Because Just because I'm getting L bar to within one bit of the entropy doesn't mean I'm minimizing L bar. Really what I want to do is minimize the number of bits per symbol. L bar is the average number of bits per symbol uh, weighted by the, the frequency of each symbol. The smaller L bar is, the better my compression is. So my actual goal is to minimize L bar. I just want to find the minimum value of L bar on encoding a set of links that minimizes L bar. I'm going to do that in the next lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to show that we can get L bar to within one bit of the entropy.
and it's almost like it almost sort of falls out of the sky. We could just do this. The information content uh, of, so th this value here, I'm just setting L bar to be the information content of each symbol rounded up. I take the information content of the symbol, which is this value, and I take the ceiling. So I round it up to the nearest whole number. That's it. I define each length, the length of the encoding for each symbol, to be that symbol's information content rounded up. All I have to do to prove the theorem is show that this uh, just apparently arbitrary choice that just sort of fell out of nowhere, that this first satisfies the inequality and um, that it is actually within one bit of the entropy. Okay, so first I want to show that the collection of links satisfies the inequality. And I do that with some relatively straightforward algebra. The only step I think that needs that much unpacking is this one, and it's only because of the weird way the negative signs interact with each other. So the slides say this, which is correct, this is a justification, but um, I'm just leveraging this property. So we all know that the ceiling of x is always greater than or equal to x. And if I negate both sides, then I have to flip the inequality. So the ceil negative of the ceiling of x is less than or equal to negative x. Um, and I also will observe this fact, which is if I know that x is less than y, then I also know that 2 to the x is less than 2 to the y, because the exponentiation function is, is monotonically increasing. So combining those two pieces of information together, I can make this leap here. So I have 2 to the negative ceiling of something, and then I can just delete the, um, I, I can say that's less than or equal to 2 to the, to the negative not ceiling. I can just remove the ceiling operator, and I get this. Uh, and then I just move the negative sign around a bit. So I, I pull the negative sign inside, and I end up with this. Uh, and then I flip the fraction, and I end up with this. And then I've got 2 to the power of log base 2 of something, which cancels out. And so I just end up adding together all the probabilities. And of course, that equals 1. And so if I skip across the line of algebra, what I have demonstrated is that this is less than or equal to this. And that uh, inequality is the Kraft-McMillan inequality. So the set of lengths does satisfy the inequality, which means there is a prefix code for this set of lengths, using that algorithm from earlier. Uh, now I have to show that L bar is less than or equal to entropy plus one, or first order entropy plus one. Okay, well, there's L bar there. All right, uh, and I defined li to be this thing. Uh, and in this uh, expansion, I'm using the fact that ceiling of x is always less than or equal to x plus 1. So that's the leap from this line to this line here. All right, then I take the plus 1 and I split it off into its own summation. So these two terms get their own special summations. I notice the summation I have on the right is just one. I'm adding up the probabilities. The summation I have on the left, uh, especially if I rearrange it a bit, looks a lot like h of s. That is exactly the formula for h of s. And so, sure enough, I have shown that L bar, which is this, is less than or equal to h of s plus one. And so I now have a way, once I compute the frequency of each symbol, once I know the distribution of things and estimate its probability, I now have a way of creating a set of code lengths um, that is viable, for which I can make a prefix code that gets me uh, an average uh, encoding length of each symbol to be within one bit of entropy. But again, remember that one bit is a long way. So 2.1, if the entropy is 2.1 and L bar is 3.1, well, you know, I might be able to get a little bit closer. This is the, the number of bits per symbol. So every single symbol, I could be as many as one full bit greater than the entropy, one third greater than apparently the theoretical minimum. Uh, so this is already pretty good, though. And the construction's pretty easy. I mean, once we have all these pieces together, it's really easy to compute this value. So, and it's easy to compute the frequency of each symbol. It's actually pretty easy to get the prefix code we want. A very, uh, a set of very simple algorithms gets us from our input sequence to the prefix code that we want. Um, however, the construction just guarantees that L bar is within a particular bound of H. It doesn't actually mean that L bar is the smallest it could possibly be. Maybe there is a better set of code links that gets L bar a little bit smaller. So coming back to our example from the very beginning, here is that sequence in the beginning, there is the information content of each symbol. The first order entropy is 3.07 bits. So were this a set of independent symbols, the smallest I could get it would be 73.77 bits. Uh, if I were to use the construction we just came up with, so if I were to set the length of each symbol's encoding to be this value, and then build a prefix code using the algorithm from earlier, I get this. 
And notice that the encoding for R, hey, it matches its uh, information content exactly. Well, because that ceiling didn't have to do any real work there. The encoding for P ends up being four bits. Well, that's fair enough. P was 3.58, I guess we rounded that up to four. The encoding for E ends up being three bits. Well, fair enough as well. The encoding for B ends up being three bits. We are guaranteed that this is a valid set of links and therefore that this is going to be a prefix code. So we have all the machinery to guarantee that. Um, and if we perform the encoding, L bar turns out to be 3.33 uh, bits. Uh, the entropy was 3.07. So actually, L bar is pretty close. Um, the bound that we came up with said that L bar was going to be with our construction at most 4.07. L bar did a pretty good job. Our construction is only 0.2 bits above the entropy of 3.07, or actually a little bit less than that. So I go from 24 bytes down to 10 bytes once I'm done rounding up. Um, I actually think counting bits is important here because of how small an example this is. Um, so I go to 80 bits. That's pretty good. Um, however, we're not quite done. We've got, uh, maybe we should tease the next lecture a bit. There's this other algorithm I can use, something called Huffman coding. And Huffman coding allows, well, I could derive a prefix code directly with Huffman coding, but I could also use Huffman coding to come up with a set of links. And Huffman coding produces a set of links that does satisfy the inequality. So suppose that I derive my code links with Huffman coding, and then I produce a prefix code using the same algorithm from earlier. Okay, so I do that. R, again, gets a two-bit encoding. But this time, P gets a three-bit encoding. In my previous example, P got a four-bit encoding. So Huffman coding was able to find a bit of efficiency. Huffman coding was able to reduce the length of some of the encodings. I think Y also gets reduced to three bits. Um, and it turns out that Huffman coding produces the optimal value of L bar. It minimizes L bar. And by using a, a code produced by Huffman coding, I go from 80 bits down to 75 on this very small input. So although our construction's pretty good, we can build prefix codes, we have some way of guaranteeing a pretty simple construction for a prefix code, it does leave a little bit of air left that I can let out. Uh, and so using Huffman coding instead, which I should add is basically free, because the compressor can spend extra time running the Huffman coding algorithm if it results in a 6% improvement. 6%, I'm willing to, to uh, use up a few more CPU cycles to get 6%. Huffman coding turns out to be a very fast algorithm, and so there's not really that much expense to using it. So we'll see in the next lecture, not only, I mean, we've seen this lecture, we can create prefix codes, and we can get L bar to within one bit of entropy, but one bit above entropy is quite a long ways. Um, using Huffman coding, we can guarantee the minimum possible L bar, and I'll have a lot to say about that in the next lecture.